Hello, I'm Gideon Burton, and I want to go through a little modeling to my students about how they can do a graphical textual analysis. This is a way of just rearranging the words in a paragraph or a passage so that you can see their structure. And this is a way of improving your ability to analyze prose. So let's just dive right in and I'll show you how to do this. This is There's not like a, a rule book for this, just kind of watch out how I do it. Um, it will somewhat depend on an understanding of grammar, but not really having a big technical vocabulary there. All right, so I'm looking at this Hoyas Valadares by Brian Doyle, beautiful personal essay. And I'm just going to take the first paragraph right here. And one of the things that you can do immediately is just go through and um, uh, every time there is a, a full stop, a complete sentence, put it on a new line and uh, just see what happens. We're going to see that some sentences will be longer than one line, so that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm looking for final punctuation mark doesn't come until clear down here. Okay, so already, I'm just, just doing nothing more than that, I'm learning something about the rhythm of sentence length that he's using in this paragraph. So he starts with a very short sentence and then he does a series of sentences that are pretty much the same size. We'll come back and talk about the repetition that's there, but I'm just I just want to point out the length of these sentences here. And then he has this very long sentence that follows. Um, we can break this up. Well, before I do that, let me just make the observation that short sentences um, can can either slow things down or they can speed things up kind of depending on which so consider the hummingbird for a moment a long moment that's kind of asking us to pause and think so I think this is the slow down kind of short sentence a hummingbird's heart beats a hummingbird's heart etc this is kind of a list of facts it feels like you're kind of going down a checklist it feels kind of slow factual and then all of a sudden we have this you know more than that total number of words come next in the rest of that paragraph and it just sort of, well, it takes flight. Um, Hoyas Voladores, flying jewels, the first white explorers in the Americas called them, and the white men had never seen such creatures for hummingbirds came into the world only in the Americas, nowhere else in the universe, more than 300 species of them whirring and zooming and nectaring and hum. Okay, can you feel like it, he's, he's trying to approximate the buzz of the hummingbirds themselves in the prose? So he starts out kind of analytical, and then he kind of gets sort of poetical, as he moves into it. Okay, now we've been able to draw conclusions about that based on nothing more than just looking at the length of the sentences. All right, I'm going to go back now and look at these a little more closely and show you how we can do some additional things with using tabs. All right, so consider the hummingbird for a long moment. I'm going to just let that one hang there and I'm start on this next one. Very obviously, we're having some repetition here. Um, what I like to do is to indent it so it stands out in a column really easily. Um, I'm looking at all the parts that are identical and then I'll kind of divide out the others from that. Um, we, uh, yeah, that's good enough. And by the way, this is a figure of speech um, known as anaphora. I'll just type that out here for anaphora. Anaphora means when you have re repeated beginnings of Sub, of um, adjacent verbal units. So a hummingbird's heart, hummingbird's heart. Okay, so we might ask ourselves what, what's the effect of that, but I'm going to just um, move on from that. So there we see um, a, a very conscious use of repetition with beginning three different sentences with the same three words. Okay, now I'm going to go on and this other, this whole last section here seems as though it's, it is a single sentence, so let's break it down a little bit into its various phrases and see what we get. So, and I think the original had this um, italicized as a foreign term. So, Hoyas Voladores, Flying Jewels, the first white explorers in the Americas called them. Okay, I'm going to just stop right there. Um, this is this sentence sort of makes you you stop because you're not quite sure what's going on. The 
Hoyas Voladores, we don't assume the reader knows Spanish and would recognize this term. Um, flying jewels, we might catch on to the fact that this was, um, a, you know, an, an appositive, which is explaining the phrase that came before it, so it's giving basically a, an English translation of the Spanish term. We might catch on to that, but we don't really get it until we finish reading, I'm going to just separate this out, uh, to the end of this clause. The first white explorers in the Americas called them. So it's taking something that we would expect to come at the end of the sentence, the, the object. Um, America's called, uh, explorers called them these things. We expect those objects to come at the end, but they're coming initially. And, and so this, breaking this apart, has helped us to see um, where it's not using a normal syntactical arrangement. It's, this is not the general order that, that we use in uh, creating English sentences. But it's foregrounding that special term, which is of course in the title of the piece, so we can see why that might be the case. Um, by the way, when you do this, when you are um, putting things into a different order than is expected, there is a rhetorical term for that called anastrophe. So you can look that up, look that up on rhetoric.boru.edu to find more about that. But anastrophe is where you're changing the expected order of things. Do you remember what the term was for the uh, successive um, verbal units that start with the same thing? Do you remember what that was? That was called anaphora, just to review. Anyway, so um, whether or not you know those terms, you can, you can see the repetition of those hummingbird hearts there, and you can also sense that this Hoyas uh, Valadores, or the flying jewels, uh, really should go when it's normally expected to go at the end. Of course, when it comes first, we can make sense of it and it draws attention to it. So when you use an astrophe, when you do something that's out of the ordinary, it does draw attention. Okay, let's go back and look at this again. Um, w when I see repetitions, those are things that I might want to try to line up and see where they go. So I see white here and I see white down here. So I'm going to back this up to put that over there and then I'm going to hit return so that I can line up white and want white. Uh, I don't know that that's really leading me anywhere but that's the sort of thing that I do. Uh, for the hummingbirds came into the world only in the Americas nor else in the universe. So we have this prepositional phrase in the Americas and then we have a um, in the universe is kind of parallel to that that you could see just a little further on along there. I don't know how important that is. Uh, when you're doing this kind of textual analysis, uh, you don't always know the importance of the structure until you lay it out. And sometimes it might be just kind of incidental. Sometimes it might be more central. But you know, I'm just showing you how how I do this. Okay, so now in this next part of this long sentence. We have more than 300 species of them whirring and zooming and nectaring in Hummer time zones. Okay, now something's going on here because we're seeing this repetition. When you see repetition, that's when you can start doing some vertical alignment uh, to do this kind of graphical analysis that I'm talking about. So I'm going to take, once I start see that repetition, I'm going to put it on a new line and I'm going to start lining it up. And generally, when I find the word and, I'm going to leave it hanging on the line before it. Uh, so that we can emphasize the the um, the more principal words that that are uh, aligned there on the left. So, so whirring and zooming and nectaring in Hummer time zones. So that's uh, there it is, and then this other kind of absolute phrase: their hearts hammering faster than we could clearly hear if we press our elephant elephantine ears to their infinitesimal chests. Okay, I'm going to leave most of that there, but as I read through this, I notice this elephantine. I wonder if I'm pronouncing that, that, that right. And I see this other infinitesimal, and it seems to me like these big polysyllabic words are somewhat parallel to each other, and they're both adjectives that precede single syllable items right there. So I'm just going to break those out so we can actually see that structure. Uh, let's do this. Okay, so I'm kind of ignoring that first part there, and I'm just going to go over to the elephantine thing here. Are you with me? Okay, so if I'm going to break this over here, um, 
elephantine ears to their infinitesimal chests. Okay, so see how I broke that out so I could just see the parallelism that's going on there. Elephantine ears, infinitesimal chests. Um, other things we at the beginning we were talking about looking at the different lengths of sentences. We can break that, that length thing can work on smaller levels as well. So we have this long adjective, elephantine, preceding a very short body part, ears, long adjective, infinitesimal, again preceding a very short noun, body part. So you can kind of see how that's working there as well. Um, now I'm going to go back to this whirring and zooming and nectaring. Okay, so for one thing, this is kind of imitating the the, the very flight of the hummingbird as it's kind of whooshing from one word to another just like a hummingbird would whoosh from one flower to another and um, you may or may not know this but this is um, these are onomatopoetic words onomatopoeia if you don't know what that term is it means let me just put it out here onomatopoeia did I spell that right? onomatopoeia Ono That's right. Okay, so it and it, it it basically see the gnome part there. It's a Greek word. It means things that sound like what they name, and so um, whirring and zooming. These 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 are words that are physical and they they seem to go together, right? I mean, they're obviously describing the movement of the hummingbird. Uh, but what about this other one down here, nectaring? So nectaring is okay. Come on, nectar is a noun, and then um, it's being used as a, a verb participle here, that ing ending, nectaring. You know, there's actually another rhetorical term for that as well, um, and it's called anthemeria. When you use one part of speech like uh, as another part of speech, um, sometimes this goes horribly wrong, like when sportscasters say that, oh, look at the great defensing that guy was doing, where they take the, the noun defense and turn it into a gerund defensing when you already have a perfectly good word that means the same thing that's already in English defending but still they have to call it defensing that's kind of wacky you take chances when you use anthemeria but in this case I think it actually works pretty well because you understand exactly what it means a hummingbird nectaring is what it's going around sucking out nectar it makes perfect sense so it's kind of a, a novel use of a word there alright so I've, I've moved away for just a moment from looking at the um, you know, graphical layout of the syntax to just do a couple of comments on words. But let's go on. I'm going to go to the, the next uh, paragraph, paragraph two. Okay, still talking about hummingbirds. And as I said before, what I can do is just break out the sentences and just see where that takes me. I'm looking for the capital letters that begin new sentences and hopefully I'm not missing any of them there uh, blah, blah 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 there's a lot of stuff going on down there okay so isn't this interesting it's kind of following the same arrangement as the very first one in terms of having some short um, sentences at the beginning followed by one huge in this case maybe two huge sentences uh, and I'll just break those out here so you can see those within the paragraph. All right, let's go back and look more closely. Each one visits a thousand flowers a day. They can dive at 60 miles an hour. They can fly backwards. Now this is a list of facts, right? And this, do you see how it's very parallel to the list of facts up here? In fact, this, I don't know why I have this second page in here. I kind of copied the first paragraph and I'm going to get rid of that. Anyway. Um, we have a list of three facts, just like in the beginning of paragraph one. It's very parallel. And we, you even have, not, not purely, but you even have, uh, they can, they can, followed by a verb. Um, and, and so it's, you have that anaphora, at least two instances of it, um, binding together those three facts. Okay, fine. Now let's see what else is going on here. They can fly more than 500 miles without pausing to rest. But when they rest, they come close to death. On frigid nights or when they are starving, they retreat into torpor, their metabolic rate slowing to a 15th of their normal sleep rate, their hearts, okay. 
how do we break this down? We just try to find anything that has a parallel structure so we can then break it out into some kind of a column. Uh, we could do that with something like the word rest because you have um, pausing to rest and then again we have the rest. I don't actually think that goes anywhere. Um, it's, it's just a standard way of you, you pick up off of a concept from the end of the last sentence as you're moving to the next sentence, a very common stylistic move, but nothing particularly remarkable about that, so I'm going to erase that. Okay, but now we have this on frigid nights or when they are starving. Now when I see a conjunction like and or or, it's inviting me to look at um, constructions that might be parallel on either side of that, and that's that's true. These these are somewhat, they're parallel in terms of their content because each of them suggests some kind of a condition, frigid nights or when they are starving. Now, technically speaking, these are not grammatically parallel because you have on frigid nights, that's a prepositional phrase, and when they are starving is a, uh, um, a clause. So we'll just uh, move on from that. Uh, these are the conditions. Uh, they retreat into torpor their metabolic rate slowing, blah, blah, blah. I'm seeing a lot of there in there. So let's see if I can break that out. Their metabolic rate slowing. Their hearts sludging. Okay, now look at this. You have, <clears throat> I'm going to break this out again. I'm going to, what I noticed was um, we have there plus something that is theirs that's having some sort of a verb that ends in ing. Right, so their metabolic rate slowing, their hearts sludging. You see that? I can break this out here. Maybe, maybe I won't. That's too messy. So you can see that um, slowing and sludging are parallel. They retreat into a torpor. Their metabolic rate slowing. Blah blah blah. Their hearts sludging. You see, do you see that? We found when when you find the things that repeat you find that there's a kind of center of gravity to them or they, they just kind of gr ground things. Um, so maybe they slow things or anchor them. I'm trying to find a metaphor, but and this is what you want to look for. Uh, sl sl sludging nearly to a halt, barely beating, and if they are not soon going... Okay, look, another repetition. If they... Did you see that? So I'm going to break that out over here. If they are not soon, dorm, soon warmed if they do not soon find that which is sweet then there is this consequence okay so we have another set of conditions if they are not soon warmed if they do not soon find notice we had some conditions before up here on frigid nights or when they are starving it's just kind of interesting parallel functions there but um, these two conditional clauses uh, if they are not soon warmed if they do not soon find that which is sweet then the consequence is their hearts grow cold and they cease to be. There's an and, so I told you when you see conjunctions, you can start lining things up, and we have their hearts grow cold and they cease to be. So um, two very obvious uh, par parallel clauses there. Okay, let's move on from that. Uh, consider for a moment those hummingbirds who did not open their eyes again today, this very day, in the Americas. That's kind of interesting where it has today in this very day. I mean, we could break out, oops, we could break out um, today if we wanted to. Um, and, and then this very day, obviously, day is parallel with today right there uh, in the Americas. But actually, I don't think that's a big deal. I think what we're really leading up to here is the list, a huge list that follows that colon. So I'm going to um, delete that graphical structuring because it doesn't seem to be all that important. Now keep in mind, you don't have to exhaustively break down every part of every paragraph or sentence. You're just developing your eyes to see things. And so, it's, you know, I very often will skip over sentences that, that, that don't seem to be having a, a discernible structure or, or parallel or, or somehow clearly related to what precedes or follows it, and that's okay. And I'm going to do that with this next sentence that starts with consider and move ahead to where I see this colon. Because I can tell this writer likes to use lists. And lists are often set up in nice parallel ways. So let's see if that proves true here. Okay. So 
he is here obviously listing a bunch of birds, birds who might not open their eyes again. Very sad. Okay, bearded helmet crests and booted racket tails, violet tailed sylphs and violet capped wood nymphs. Wow, I can tell already we're going to have some fun analyzing this on the level of just richly concrete uh, language, vivid, colorful uh, nouns and, and adjectives. But but I'm going to hold off on that for a second because I'm trying to just look for structure right now. And right now, the easiest way to look for structure might be just to create a new line indented every time I see a comma to see what I come up with. And sure enough, I am going to see this very parallel list of different kinds of hummingbirds. And there they are. Wow, someone has looked things up on Wikipedia or wherever. Um, yeah, let's see, that's something else a little different there. We'll come back to that. All right, I think that's about where that ends up. Now, I'm going to go back to this list because I'm, I see another repetition inside of this, okay? If you see the word and that's popping up here, you have that conjunction that's showing up everywhere, all right? So you can separate that out because that gives a kind of um, structure here because we keep hearing that word and. Um, so I'm going to put every and on its own, you know, lined up in this column here to see it. And then, oh, well, look at this. What are we getting? Looks like it's not just a list. It's a paired list. So we have two different kinds of, of um, hunting, hummingbirds that are indicated uh, at a time. And then we have the next set. Bearded helmet crests and booted racket tails. Violet tailed sylphs and violet capped wood nymphs. Crimson topazes and purple crowned fairies. Red tailed comets and amethyst wood stars, rainbow bearded thornbills and glittering bellied emeralds, velvet purple coronets and golden bellied star fronts, fiery tailed all bills and Andean hillsters, spatula tails and puff legs. Wow, that's just awesome language. Um, the structure is really easy to see, right? And we can evaluate. I want to go down into the nuts and bolts of the language here because it's so much fun. But for the moment, we just take that whole set of things, that great list. We see that there's parallelism and there's also symmetry because you have this. On the one hand, we have the thing on the left side of the end. And on the other, we have the thing on the right side of the end. Bearded helmet crests and booted racket tails. Violet tailed sylphs and violet capped wood nymphs. We love symmetry. We love balance, and this is creating a prose rhythm through having these. Um, and and the rhythm is, is helped by the fact that the elements on each side are roughly balanced in terms of having about the same uh, number of syllables. Um, you even have some other kinds of parallelism going on internally, like um, these hyphenated ones, right, that start with an adjective, and then they have some sort of a compound noun, right? So bearded helmet crests and booted racket tails. Uh, this has got some great rhythm to it. Listen to that. Bearded helmet crests and booted racket tails. There's three beats on each side of this conjunction. Violet tailed sylph sylphs and violet capped wood nymphs. The, it's not exactly parallel on this next line in terms of the total number of syllables, but it's still roughly balanced there. Plus, you have some internal um, uh, cohesion going on here by the repetition of violet. Violet tailed and violet capped. So we got tails and we got heads that, okay. Now we have crimson topazes, purple crowned fairies. So we have these, obviously, you have this um, um, color as being the, often the initial word in the description of these different hummingbirds violet, crimson, red, rainbow. Etc. Golden. It's nice. Um, Red-tailed comets, amethyst wood stars, rainbow bearded thornbills, glittering bellied emeralds. Uh, a lot of these follow the very same pattern of having, you know, some kind of a compound adjective or compound noun that is in, in combination in a, basically a three-word uh, name for 
these cute little critters. Now, it, it breaks down at the end because you have golden belly star frontlets. Uh, it's probably four syllables, golden belly star front. Yeah, four beats there. Fiery tailed all bills and Andean hill star. So there's four beats, three about three beats now, about two, maybe three. Anyway, it's it's slowing down. You're getting fewer uh, items until you get to single ones at the end. It's like he's had this energy to give this great big long list, and then towards the end, he's got to kind of run out of breath. So you have the spatchel tails and the puff legs. All right, so. When you have how many how many one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sixteen different species that he looked up. And it you know, isn't it good that he left out that seventeenth one? You know what I mean? Because we have the symmetry that's there. Anyway, cumulatively it has an effect. When you have lots of parallel things in series, it tends to have a climactic effect. So it, it's leading to a climax. Each the most amazing thing you have never seen. All right, now let's, let's, I'm going to put this actually on a new page. Am I? No, it's fine. Okay, each the most amazing thing you have never seen. Okay, a little play there. We're expecting ever seen, but it's never seen. Each thunderous wild heart the size of an infant's fingernail. That's quite an image, isn't it? Each mad heart silent. How brilliant. Music stilled. Now, if you've forgotten, he'd started this by saying, consider the, you know, they're so fragile, these creatures, how many of them do not open their eyes again? You know, all these, you know, beautiful names, therefore beautiful creatures, and yet it's so sad because each of these is, can, can die any given day. They're just very fragile. Each, so it's amazing, um, we have this kind of emotional reaction, each thunderous wild heart the size of an infant's fingernail, a kind of awe aspect there was realizing just how tiny these fast little hearts go and each mad heart silent a bruise a brilliant music stilled now I'm gonna do something here uh, obviously I've lined up each each and each here and we can kind of feel that parallelism as he's reaching his climax and, and that but I also want to show how there's a kind of emotional dynamic happening there at the same time so each mad heart silent a brilliant music stilled um, I've been talking a little bit about prose rhythm, and it's really important. And this this graphical analysis can help us to hear and feel physically the um, the rhythms of the prose. And I want to show you how that works just in this one line. So he's slowing things down as he comes to the end. And one way he does this is by having a series of monosyllabic words. And when you have that, it, it tends to slow you. And so each one of these words can take a beat. We could break them down. Each mad heart silent. And then we have brilliant music stilled. So it's there's kind of a parallel length there, uh, although they're doing different, slightly different things. But again, we have I mean brilliant multisyllabic, but almost every word here is a monosyllabic word, almost. Each mad heart, music stilled. So can you just feel it slowing down? It's it's making a parallel to the actual slowing of the animal's hearts. Okay, this is something that's beautiful, is that prose can sometimes echo implicitly, not explicitly. It's not saying, hey, look, 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 read this, how the prose is gonna sound just like a hummingbird's heart is stopping. Aren't I clever? No, it's there implicitly. But that's the pleasure of this. The pleasure of form is that it is a, a complement to the content and can approximate it, even if we're not fully conscious of it. So that's that's pretty cool. All right, let's see what else we can do here. Paragraph three. Hummingbirds, like all flying, I'm gonna separate this out here. Come back. Yeah, there we go. Hummingbirds, like all flying birds, but more so, have inc incredible, enormous, immense, ferocious metabolisms. What? What? Okay, I know how to make a series because, you know, I've been doing it and watching it for many years, and don't you have to have commas? But he's not putting the commas in, so we're, we're going to take these elements in a series and break them out. So, uh, hummingbirds, like all flying birds, but more so, have incredible, enormous, 
immense, ferocious metabolisms. Now, some style teachers will tell you, you know, easy on the adjectives there. That's kind of the uh, low-grade way of making really good prose. But, you know, sometimes the adjectives are where it's at. They can really be wonderful. And here, um, when I break them out, first of all, this, this, the, com the punctuation. No commas. What's the effect of that? Commas are a tiny pause. So basically, by eliminating those, it's asking you to rush through these, right? Uh, hummingbirds have incredible, enormous, immense, ferocious metabolisms, right? It's just this whole big pile of adjectives leading up to metabolisms. And it's sort of, again, it's it, they, they have an accelerated metabolism. Well, the metabolism of the sentence is running very high as well because the rapidity of the words, the lack of the punctuation is propelling us forward into that final idea of metabolisms, okay? Okay, so to drive these metabolisms, they have race car hearts that eat oxygen, eat oxygen at an eye-popping rate. Okay, let's just look at that for a second. Uh, we could have lined up metabolisms and metabolisms, but it doesn't really seem to be doing anything particular there, so I'm just going to leave that where it's at. They have race car hearts. Let's pause for a moment and appreciate a good metaphor. Race car hearts. Okay, so here we have, this is actually an example of anthemeria again. Remember what that is? Maybe you've forgotten already. Anthemeria means when you're using some one part of speech as another part of speech. So race car is a car's thing. So a race car is a noun. Um, well, I guess the, the race part is an adjective, but when you link it together, it becomes this compound noun, right? It's adjective and noun together. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons love to do that, by the way. Anyway, race car hearts. So race car as a whole is functioning as an adjective to hearts. So this is, this is both a metaphor, because hearts are not racing cars, but we're comparing them by calling it that. Uh, it's a metaphor in a noun form that's functioning as an adjective. So there you go. Race car hearts. Now let's let's change gears and look at this in terms or listen to this in terms of sound. Race car hearts. Okay, the R sound is connected to both race and car. So we have the R sound at the beginning there and the end there. Car race car and hearts. So the R sound is carried across all three of those words. Um, plus we have the uh, R sound, A-R, is in car and it's in hearts. So these words, the, the, the term for this, we say they rhyme or they have assonance. And that's when you have repeated vowel sounds next to each other, assonance. Okay, so race car hearts that eat oxygen at an eye-popping rate. Those are kind of parallel in a certain way. You have race car hearts that eat oxygen at an eye-popping rate. I don't know. They, they seem to, each of those parts seem to have just two parts to them, but eh, I won't make too much of, about that. Let's go on. All right. Their hearts are built of thinner, leaner fibers than ours. Okay. Their hearts are built of thinner, leaner fibers. So you could break down these adjectives and notice how they're parallel, thinner, leaner, and even though this is not grammatically parallel, because fibers is actually what thinner and leaner are modifying, but did you notice something parallel in their sound, okay? So they're not grammatically parallel, but they are semantically parallel, which means they have similar, no, no, they're not semantically parallel. Uh, that means, semantics means meaning. They're sonically parallel. They have the similar sounds, thinner, leaner fiber, thinner, leaner fibers than ours. Even that R is a bit of an echo of the... And and, and again, I, I keep coming back to prose rhythm. Notice how thinner has an accent on the first syllable. So does leaner. So does fibers. They all have a pattern of accented, unaccented, accented, unaccented. This is actually known as a trochaic rhythm, by the way trochaic, but that's from prosody or poetry, and we're looking at prose. So anyway, but, but prose can have rhythm, just like poetry has rhythm. It's just more subtle. Their hearts are built of thinner, leaner fibers than ours. Okay, now we have 
their arteries and notice how that is parallel with their hearts. Their hearts, their, their arteries, okay, are stiffer and more taut. They have more mitochondria in their heart muscles. Okay, just, let's just take that. So, wait a minute. Haven't we seen this pattern before? We have a fact, a second fact, and a third fact. Hmm, if we go back to the very top, we have a fact, a second fact, a third fact. At the beginning of paragraph one, beginning of paragraph two, fact, second fact, third fact. He's writing in a very parallel fashion, paragraph by paragraph. He begins each paragraph, at least so far, with a set of three facts. It works in all three of those um, paragraphs so far. Okay. Anything to gulp more oxygen? Uh, we have more theirs lined up, so maybe we have more than three. Their hearts are stripped to the skin for the war against gravity and inertia. Okay. For for the war and the mad search for food. Okay, when we see, um, th this is an example of ellipsis. Ellipsis is where, let me just spell that out for you, ellipsis. Okay, that does not mean the three dots. That uh, That's another meaning of the word ellipsis, but in, in this case, ellipsis is related to the three dots, but it stands for uh, leaving something out because it's implied. So, in this case, where does the ellipsis happen? Their hearts are stripped to the skin for the war against gravity and inertia. Okay, I'm going to put it out like this so you can see it. The mad search for food. The insane idea of flight. Okay. Now, can you see that we have another set of parallel things um, th there's you know this preposition for or what the war the mad search the insane idea um, even, even this is a bit parallel inside this we have four plus we have the definite article then we have a noun um, the or the mad, the insane idea of flight. Okay, so slightly different rhythm at the end. But start watching for these threes, because what you often see is that um, the, the third element is something that will either lengthen or, or it may slow, but you, you kind of build a rhythm of threes. Okay, it's just another thing to observe about form. Okay, let's, let's look at this last part of this paragraph. The price of their ambition is a life closer to death. They suffer more heart attacks and aneurysms and ruptures than any other living creature. Oh, my repetition antenna just went boop, 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 boop. Where do I see that? Um, uh, they suffer more heart attacks and aneurysms and ruptures. Okay. Let's break those out. Heart attacks and aneurysms and ruptures. Okay. So I'm going to put those ands out there so we can see them a little bit better. Um, they suffer more heart attacks and aneurysms and ruptures. Okay, now why didn't he use a comma after the first one? He could have said they suffer more heart attacks, aneurysms, and ruptures. And we could have just had just one and. Why does he have two? Well, this is actually, there's a figure known as <clears throat> polysyndeton. You can look that up on the force of rhetoric, rhetoric.bou.edu. Um, anyway, many connectors. So when you have polysyndeton, you have lots of conjunctions. And that tends to draw things out, maybe slow them down. It also has a kind of implicit suggestion that they're, I could have made this list longer, right? Um, the price of their ambition, yeah, they suffer more heart attacks and aneurysms and ruptures, and there's probably a bunch of other things because I put the and in there more. If I didn't have the and in there and I just had a comma, it might be that I was saying there these are the only three things that they tend to suffer more. See what I'm saying? Sometimes the slightest difference of a word can have a different connotation. This is what we do when we analyze prose. We find out those cool little things. 
All right, then any other creature. I suffer more than any other creature. Okay, it's expensive to fly. Now, I'm going to start, again, breaking out these into, um, you know, putting each sentence on a line just to see what we got here. Remember, that's in just a really quick initial way of analyzing prose graphically. Uh, just start finding the capital letters and the end punctuation and putting things on their own line. I'm going to put this on a new page so I can see it better. <clears throat> it's expensive to fly. You burn out. You fry the machine. You melt the engine. Wow, well, okay, what do we got going on here? We have a, four short sentences, but these three um, are all starting with the word you. Do you remember that term that I, I was telling you about for uh, beginning um, adjacent verbal units with, in the same way? It's called anaphora, okay? <clears throat> it's expensive to fly. You burn out. You fry the machine. You melt the engine. Okay. Now, let's think about this. We're seeing a lots of sets of three. Um, we're seeing lots of anaphora. Let's pause and think a little bit now about the use of this pronoun. This is the second person pronoun. I is first person. You is second person. He, she, they. That's third person. So, okay, we are not hummingbirds. But there's this use of the second person, you, which really is a kind of casual way of talking about the subject of whatever you're talking about. So you burn out, you fry the machine, you melt the engine. It's maybe it's just helping along the, the metaphors that are there. Um, and then we go on to every creature on Earth has approximately 2 billion heartbeats to spend in a lifetime. Okay, I can see spend, I can see spend, I can see spend. Ah, let's line those up. Heartbeats to spend. To spend. Okay. I'm going to put there to spend. You can spend them slowly. And, you know, I want to fit it all on a line, so I'm going to just do this. You can spend them slowly, or you can spend them fast. Okay, do you see how these are very obviously parallel with one another? Okay, and the entire um, clauses there with, they have a, you can spend them slowly, and then the phrase begins with like, which is of course a simile, like a tortoise, well, it's not a simile, it's just referring to a, a type of thing. So, like a tortoise and live to be 200 year, 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 years old, like a hummingbird and live to be two years old. Do you see how that's parallel? Let me break it down even more so you can see it. Um, you can spend them slowly, like a tortoise, and live, or you can spend them fast like a hummingbird and live to be two years old. Now, th this is a really profound part of his essay. You know, it's like, okay, first of all, everyone gets two billion heartbeats. I wonder how true that is, but wow, um, you can spend them slowly, you can spend them fast. You, you, you see the beautiful parallelism of that? You have something that's um, okay, we have often the combination of parallelism with opposites, or what is sometimes called, in rhetorical terms, antithesis, okay, or opposites. So, where do we see that happening here? Well, we have slowly and fast, and we have 200 years old, and we have two years old. Now, he has been very clever here because you have the parallelism of two and two, and old, and old, but what a difference between 200 and two years, right? So we have the pleasure, the, uh, as people who read and experience prose, we like to have th patterns. We love things that are parallel. But we also really get a kick out of things that are opposites. We understand the world more clearly in terms of opposition. And so here we're getting both. We're getting both the parallelism and the opposition, the antitheses. 
So that's pretty cool. All right, I think I'm going to pause right there because that's been a lot so far, but hopefully you've been able to see how you can make observations about structure, about uh, rhythm, um, about um, uh, pacing of things from how I've broken those things out. Uh, it, it really does help us to see the, uh, the effects that happen when you have language that's it's patterned orally through our ears, but when we pattern it for our eyes, then suddenly we can maybe feel it and certainly analyze it a little bit more closely, and that's been my purpose here. So try your hand at doing graphic textual analysis. Uh, you can certainly do this in a handwritten way. Sometimes it's easier to do it in a typewritten way uh, because you can you can go back and change your um, um, alignment. Like if I realize, oh, I, I, I wanted to align this here rather than there, and it's just easier to do on a computer. But I, I think it's um, valuable to do by, by hand also. So, end of lecture.